Welcome to Jerry Snacks, snackable episodes about the Jerry exam and graduate school admissions. I'm Tyler, the founder of Achievable. We have an affordable $199 online GRE course that includes everything you need to ace your GRE. A full textbook, tons of GRE questions backed by our memory enhancing algorithm, and full length practice exams. You can try it out for free at achievable.me, and if you like it, the code podcast gets you 10% off at checkout. Now let's get started. So today we have Brian Prestia from Reason Test Prep on the line with us again. And Brian, if you could just give a quick intro about yourself. Yeah, thanks, Tyler. Um, so yeah, again, I'm, I'm Brian Prestia from Reason Test Prep. We do online SAT, ACT, GMAT, and GRE tutoring. I've been I've been doing this for about 20 years. And um, as I said on the um, other uh, previous uh, episode, I um, you know I've personally been doing GRE the longest. That's that's really where I got started. Uh, and mm-hmm. really, we mostly do GMAT and GRE at this point. We we do SAT and ACT, but really, the bulk of our stuff is GMAT and GRE. Great. Yeah. And so the topic today is something that you really feel um, is important. And and just to preface this for the audience, right, like this is like more almost like a philosophy one, right? But I think it's I think it's a really cool topic and excited to dig into it. And the title of it is The Principle of No Ambiguity. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I made that up. That's <laughs> that's uh, that's, <laughs> that's well, it's your it's your principle now. <laughs> Trademark it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Hopefully, hopefully I didn't read that somewhere and, and think it was mine when it wasn't. But yeah, I, I've never seen it anywhere else. So, um, yeah. You, would you like me to just kind of explain? Yeah, that sounds great. OK. So, yeah. So basically, this is this applies to verbal questions specifically. So. What where this stems from is that you know most most people view math questions, the quantitative questions, as unambiguous, right? You know, it's it's mm-hmm. black and white. So you know, if you if if the question asks right. you to solve for x, you solve for x, and it's like okay, x equals four, and no one's going to be like, well, okay, you know, yeah, the test is telling me it's four. I think it's three, right? That's just not the way math works. It's perfectly black and white, and you know, in almost all cases, right? You know, and so, but people, when they when they do verbal questions, they they just don't see it that way. They see it as a much more as more of like a gradient of of like you know things are better and worse, and this is good and bad, and and they they use all these words of of gradation. Um, I like this answer. I don't really like that. I like this more, and that's really not helpful <laughs> because right yeah because the the verbal. I mean, it's a standardized test, right? There has to be you know, an objectively correct answer and objectively incorrect answers. And so your starting point has to be that that is the nature of the test. And when, Mm -hmm. when you feel like it's, it's, you know, that there are two answers that could both be right. um, And that, and that it's, you know, it's kind of ambiguous. That's on you, right? Like it's, it's actually not ambiguous. You're just failing to see why one answer is definitely right. And the other one's wrong. And It doesn't mean that just knowing this will allow you to get a perfect score in the verbal section. Like, obviously, it's not that simple, but it's 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 got to be your starting point is there is a right answer and there are wrong answers. It is black and white. And I if I'm failing to see that, then I'm doing something wrong. It's not the test. Right. I mean, the the test takers or test makers, excuse me, they actually are they're kind of like legally required to have a defensible reason for every wrong answer. Exactly. Right. Because you could arguably get sued about, oh, like, you know, I should have gotten this question right when it was wrong. And therefore, I didn't get into HBS and it's all your fault. Mm -hmm. Um, But I I think that, uh, yes, with that context, then, right, there's got to be. A right a reason why if you've got two choices that you think are good there's got to be a reason why one of them isn't right yes. that's kind of where what i take away from this is that like you should be trying to apply some kind of thought process to i one of these has to be wrong i need to figure out which one it is and, and why it's wrong yeah is that the, is that the better way to go about it or would you do it the opposite way and i then try to go for which one is right because i feel like if you think both of them are right then you're already kind of like in a confirmation bias place, but that's just me. Yeah. So like, there's nuance to this. So uh, let me, maybe let me elaborate. So first of all, I think, I think it probably is a little bit different on the vocab based questions versus the reading comp questions. That's, that's maybe one differentiator. So we could maybe talk about both. And then, you yeah. know, you probably, I mean, ultimately you want to do both. You want to be able to see why, and that's actually a, a deeper point that we can get at, but you want to be able to 
to understand why the right answer is right and be able to say that the other answers are wrong. Because if you if you can do that, okay, so this is this is a kind of abstract point, but let me let me make it because this is something I, you know, I definitely preach. Um, it's something we we teach and I, I think it's just a critical thing. So if if you're only picking what you think is the right answer, right? And especially if you get it down to two and you're like, all right, it's one of these two, this one's better, right? Well, you're really just making like one judgment, right? And if that judgment is wrong, you're wrong, basically. You're getting the question wrong, right? Whereas right. if you accept that there are, let's just say on a reading comp question, there are, you know, five answer choices and, you know, obviously four of them are wrong, one of them is right. If And let's just say that three of them are obviously wrong, right? So you throw those out, those, those are out, right? And you get it down to two. And, and that's also, by the way, how they often construct these questions, right? Is that some of the wrong answers are, are more obviously wrong. And then, you know, they'll have two answers, one of which is right, the other of which is wrong, but the, the wrong one is very close, basically. And so okay. it's the one that most people pick when they get it wrong. And by the way, this, this is going to sound, this is going to sound a little bit um, critical and mocking, but you know, when people are like, well, you know, I did get it down to the last, you know, I did, I did get it down to two. Well, right. yeah, but that's, that's not necessarily that hard. The key is that last step of differ differentiating between those two. So. And right. It, and there's no partial credit. Exactly. Yeah. So, and it's by design that like they're, they're, they're almost like leading you to that one wrong answer. They don't need you to be tempted by all four wrong answers. Right. They just need right. everyone to pick one wrong answer. And there, so it could be just one very, very tempting wrong answer, really. Um, and so. If you're holding yourself accountable on those last two answers, right, to be able to say, okay, I can see why this answer is right. I could defend this answer and I could also defend why this wrong answer is wrong, right? Well, right. now you would have to be right twice to get that question wrong, right? You'd have to be, you'd have to be wrong on both of those judgments to get the question wrong. And so... In a way, you have double the chance of catching a mistake. And, and honestly, as someone, you know, I... You know, I, I excel at the verbal section of the GRE and, and the GMAT too. I, I very, very rarely miss questions, but like I make mistakes and I often catch them because I'll find a right, I'll find an answer that I think is right. But okay, that, that seems right. And then I go further and I'm like, wait a second, that one seems right too. And then, you know, it's that, that's that step right there that, that really catches me. And then, then it's game on. It's like, all right, like, why is one of these right? Why is the other one wrong? And yeah, I mean, I, I need to be wrong on both of those counts to get that question wrong. Right. And I, I like that it almost sounds like you built in a little personal checkpoint there where if, there, if you ever see or feel like two answers are correct, then you, then really the alarm bells go off and you're like, okay, well now we know what, what the two answers are that they were actually trying to make us choose between. And I've got to figure out which one is the right one and go back to like square one with both of those answers and kind of like bottoms up, do it again. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's exactly right. And you know, if we, if we apply that to reading comp, just to kind of give an example, Again, I would say this happens to me all the time. I, I actually just expect it now because I, you know, and I, this is also something we teach that people should expect this. But, you know, the answer choices are often so similar that at first glance, you just you can't process them at the level of um, specificity and precision that you need to in order to see why, you know, A is right and B is wrong. So, you know, you read A and you're like, OK, yeah, that, that sounds great. And then you read B and you're like, OK, shoot, like that sounds really good too. And then sometimes you read C and you're like, oh man, like that sounds like it's right also, you know? And then that's not, that's not just a failure on your part. That's just, that's just like level one pass through the answer choices. Now you have to go back to them again and read them again. And then, you know, if you're being really precise, you start to be like, oh, wait a second. Like I didn't notice that, but like choice B is actually saying this. And that's just, that's just wrong. Like that one word right there is wrong. Um, and so right. I love that answer, but that word's wrong and therefore this thing's out. Yeah. So that was going to be my next question is like, how do you dig in and, and really like, what are, what are the things to look for when you've got a, like a, a verbal problem that you've kind of narrowed it down to two or maybe three answer choices and you're trying to figure out sort of who's, which one's the fake. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What, what's sort of the process that you go through there? Okay. Um, let me let me come back to that in a second, but let me let me first sure. throw one more principle in there 
that uh, that yeah, I didn't sure. I didn't explicitly hit, um, but I, maybe I'm hinting at it. But I think this is this is part of being able to do what you know the process that you're asking about. So, mm-hmm. so the other the other idea that you have to understand, and this is, again, this is just something we preach. This is this is a core part of like what we teach on verbal stuff, and it's it's on the GRE, it's on the GMAT, also it's on all these standardized tests. Is that on a hard question? Um, you know, part of the problem is not just that the they, that a wrong answer sounds really good, right? If the right mm-hmm. answer was perfect, well, then the question wouldn't be that hard because everyone would see that answer and be like, oh, yeah, well, that's obviously right. It doesn't matter how good you make the, the best wrong answer. Most people are still going to pick that perfect right answer. So what they do is they take the right answer and they make it what I call deliberately suboptimal. Right. So they, they, they push the, they suppress the, the, the right answer down almost to the point of being wrong, but it's, it's acceptable. Right. So right. that's the other part of this is you have to, you have to go in understanding that the right answer isn't necessarily going to be great. And that can be confusing because people think like, well, isn't the point of this to like pick the best, you know, the best answer that could ever be written to answer this question? And yeah, the answer to that is no, because that would be too easy. <laughs> and so, yeah, I mean, you have to go in knowing that the right answer is very likely going to be suboptimal on a really hard question. So that's that's the first step is going in, um, yeah, knowing that you're not just, you know, eliminating the wrong answers. You also have to know that the right answer might be kind of like not good, but is basically acceptable. Right, like the way um, the way you're describing it makes me think of this. Uh, I think it's a Simpsons quote, but I, I just still use it all the time, which is, "I'm technically correct, the best kind of correct," hmm. right? And it's one of those things that I think applies here, where it's um, it might be Futurama. I don't know. Either way, shout out Matt Groening, but <laughs> um, it's it's really important to remember that you're not trying to pick the answer that sounds the best to you. You're trying to pick the answer that is technically correct yes. right and it's one like i think that's what you're getting at as well it's basically like there will be a technically correct answer that they have tried to make sound as bad as possible up against a technically incorrect answer that they've tried to make sound as good as possible yeah you you said that you said that perfectly i think you just said it much better than i was saying it actually but yeah that's that's exactly <laughs> it um yeah that, that's exactly it and so yeah i mean the right answer might sound worse than the wrong answer, but it's acceptable. It's just not wrong, basically. And the wrong answer, it might, again, might sound better, but there's just something about it. And this is true of reading comp where it's like a one word wrong thing, right? Where like holistically overall, it sounds great, but like there's just one word that's just totally unacceptable. And that, that just disqualifies the entire answer, even if every bit of it, every other bit of it was better than the right answer. Yeah. Yeah, that totally makes sense. Well, then, I mean, I think, it, do you think now is the right time to talk about process? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I totally dodged that. Um, no, yeah, no, I, I, I just love, for me, it's like, I love to really get nitty gritty with the yeah. tactics, right, for, for people. Yeah, again, let me maybe just limit this to reading comp, because I, I think the process would be a little bit different for a, um, a vocab-based question. Mm-hmm. So for reading comp, if there's ambiguity, right, ambiguity in your mind, as we said, there is no ambiguity in the actual question. But if you're sensing ambiguity on a reading comp question, it's in one of three places, right? Either you're failing to see a difference between the answer choices that is a meaningful difference that, that separates you know, them and makes one right and the other one wrong. So that's probably the first place to start is to just reread the answer choices and be like, all right, like, am I missing some subtle difference here that really, yeah, just disqualifies one and makes the other one acceptable? So that's that's kind of the first place to look. This other two are the question itself and the passage. And, you know, I'd say it maybe depends. I, I wouldn't say, you, ha- you know, that you would automatically go to the passage first and then the question. It, it might depend on the situation, but those are the other two places to look. So sometimes it's like you haven't actually processed or understood what the question's really asking. So, you know, mm-hmm. yeah, again, like a function question that's asking, you know, the author's intention you might be, you might have read it and processed it as like, you know, the question's asking, what did the author say? But really the question's mm-hmm. asking, why did the author say it? What's the purpose of that, of that sentence? And that's the reason that you're stuck in this like place of, in your, your, my, uh, my expression here is you're flailing around in a sea of ambiguity. 
So that might be right. the reason that you're flailing around. And then the final place is to go back to the passage, right? I mean, the answer is going to be in the passage. And so it might be that there's something that you just totally missed or that you misunderstood and you have to go back and find it in the passage in order to, to differentiate. Yeah. And then when you're evaluating answer choices, are there any like kind of keywords or key sections of the, of the answer to that you look at, right? Like I think in a previous episode, somebody said something along the lines of like, if something ever says like never or not, or something like that, like that oftentimes can be a really, you know, that kind of an absolute can be really telling one way or the other. Do you have any other thoughts like that? Yeah, again, there's so much nuance to this. It, it, this, could, this could be another, we do another podcast just on this alone, honestly. Um, <laughs> so I'm going to try to keep it brief. But yes, there, there are patterns in the wrong answers. And that is part of being good at, you know, if you really want to be good at, at reading comp and just crush it, it helps a lot um, to, to really understand the patterns of, of the wrong answers. So um, yeah, I mean, again, I could go into a lot more detail, but on just on that, on that one point about the severity of the answer, um, that kind of depends on the question, actually. So I, th- I actually did hear that, that, that bit of that podcast, I think. And, um, I think that was actually talking about the argument questions, which this right. is a whole nother point of confusion, but the, but the GRE insists on calling reading comp. Um, really, it uses the word reading comp for what, what on the GMAT and then the LSAT are two totally different question types. One is an argument question type and the other is a traditional reading comp. So, but for the argument questions, um, yeah, like the questions that ask you to draw inferences, basically. And that could appear even on reading comp. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, like, a, you know, a really bold um, statement will tend to be wrong. And that's true also of a question asking you about an assumption right. because an assumption tends to be more modestly worded. Um, and, and your guest, I think, like did a really good illustration of that. But it's actually not always wrong. So, you know, on the argument questions, on a question that asks you to strengthen or weaken an argument, you actually want a really strongly worded answer. Because one that's worded right. in, you know, if an answer that says something like, you know, some people might not, you know, do this, on a strengthen or weaken question, that's usually wrong. Um, in fact, I would actually go as far as to say, if you see the word sum as the first word on a strength and a weaken question, I mean, if you were really in a time pinch, I would <laughs> throw it really out without even reading yeah. it. Yeah, I mean, it almost certainly wrong, basically. Yeah, so there are definitely patterns that things that you pick up on. And yeah, that, that goes back to like really making a study of questions and, you know, being very deliberate in your practice and really trying to, um, you know, deconstruct the test. Yeah, fantastic. Well, this is a, this actually, I think, has a ton of really actionable stuff in it, and it's really helpful. Is there anything that you want to conclude with here on, on this topic? Hey, um, <laughs> so I, I think, like I said, I think the, the thing to just understand is that this is really just the starting point, right? Like, you you know, I don't, I don't want to make people think that having this mentality is sufficient by itself. It's, it's like necessary, right. but not sufficient. So you have to come from the starting point, and then there's a lot of a lot of subtle work that you have to do to really be able to parse the answers and understand why one is right and the other wrong. But if you're, you know, if you take the attitude of like, Oh, this is better. I like this one more. All those words of gradation, they need to, they need to go out the door immediately. You need to be speaking in the language of this is right. This is wrong. This is acceptable. This is unacceptable. It's a binary black and white thing. And that's gotta be your starting point. Yeah. Great. Thank you so much. This has been Jiri Snacks, hosted by Tyler from Achievable, with Brian Prestia from Reason Test Prep. Achievable has a great online Jiri course that you can try for free at achievable.me. Give it a look, and if you like it, you can use the code PODCAST to get 10% off when you buy it.